to reintroduce ourselves. Okay, hi everyone. Again, in the recording, uh, my name is Kavish, um, and I'm one of the workshop leaders. I'll pass it on briefly to my co-workshop leaders just to introduce themselves. Uh, hey to everyone who's just tuning in now or watching the recording. I'm Marcio. I'm in my fourth year, and I'm taking biochemistry, ecology, and evolutionary biology and physiology. And I'm Maya. I am the last workshop leader. I am a fourth year student and I am majoring in history with a focus in law and history and double minoring in linguistics and book and media studies. All right. And I don't think I introduced my program, but I'm doing pharmacology and toxicology specialist. But now we're going into the meat of this presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about courses primarily in this workshop, but I think I'm going to briefly touch upon programs on this slide, just so you have an idea of the general uh, system of picking courses. So what are programs? So programs are specialized areas of study that you will be taking. Um, you will only have to choose your program towards the end of your first year, but knowing what types of programs that you might be interested in uh, really may help you choose which courses you might want to enroll in. And I'll go over how these programs may help you choose your courses in a couple of slides. Now, what are courses? These are the subjects that you actually take. So these could be like history or sciences of what you've taken in high school, but these are typically a little bit more specialized when you come to university. And as an arts and science student, uh, you have access to a wide variety of courses relating to multiple topics and according to your needs or wants. Okay, and as we're going through this presentation, we're gonna be going over a few terms. So here are a few important terms uh, that you should know as we go through this. So the first is full course equivalents or FCEs. Um, typically you either can earn 0.5 or one full uh, FCE per class. So 0.5 is the lowest unit and that represents one semester of a single course. Whereas 1.0 is typically a full year course that runs from September until April. Um, you need to typically have 3.0 FCEs to be considered a full-time student. Um, however, it, most students take around 2.5 per semester. So that's around five courses each semester. The next is breadth requirements. And we're gonna be going over this a little later, but you're gonna see that name pop up. And it's basically just your general ed requirements that you need to do before you graduate. And we'll go into the more specifics a little later on. And the last is your GPA. So there's several GPAs that are used here at U of T. The first is your sessional GPA. So that will be your grade point average. So that's um, all the courses that you've taken during a session. And they're rated on a scale from zero to four, four being the highest score you can get. And your sessional GPA will take in your grade point average from a single semester. So either the fall, winter, or one of the two summer semesters. Your annual GPA will be um, your GPA considered for the fall and winter semesters put together. So during your entire first year, second year, third year, fourth year. And then the last GPA is your cumulative GPA. So that starts in your first year. And that will be the average GPA that you get from your first year up until your final year when you graduate. And so these are just important terms to keep in mind as we go through these presentations. Slides. Yeah, and uh, here is um, kind of a follow-up to one of those questions in the icebreaker where someone asks, how do you know your course code? And I know there's like quite a bunch of them and they all look different and all look like a, a mess of letters put together. Uh, but there is a system and we'll go over how to like interpret each course and then how to actually find uh, which courses you need to be taking. So if we zoom in in the Chem 135 right there. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So here we have a more detailed breakdown of what a course code entails. It has like many different areas. The first one is the three letter code, which indicates which department the subject belongs to. So for example, in this course, CHM would stand for chemistry. So all the chemistry department courses will be titled with a CHM at the start. 
then the next number indicates which level it's supposed to be taken on. So for example, if it's at 100 level, it's usually a first year course. A second year course would be 200 level and so forth. But it's also not restrictive. So you could be in first year and taking a 200 or 300 level course if you have the requirements. So for example, if you've taken some um, language in high school, I know in my first year I took um, Spanish 300 because I had taken um, the previous grades before. Uh, then you come to the course number, which is just a fingerprint for that specific course within the department. Then you have the credit value, like Maya mentioned before, it can either be a half credit or full credit, depending on the duration of the course. So H would indicate that it's only a semester long course. Lastly, we have the other number, which is indicative of the campus when in which it's offered. Most of you would be in the St. George campus, but for those in Scarborough or Mississauga, you also have a three or five respectively. And very last, we have which term it is taking place. So it can either be the first term. So if you're taking the regular year, it would be the first semester from September to December or the second term from January to April, or if it is a year long course, it will be a Y. So now that you know your courses and how to read them, uh, how do you pick the courses that you want to take? I mentioned a few slides ago that programs can really be one of the defining things that can help you select your courses. And for that, you need to think of a few programs that you might wanna take. Uh, there is a link at the end of this workshop slide set to um, a program explorer, or you could just search up U of T programs and that could link you to the program explorer. And looking at programs that you may be interested uh, can take you to these things which are known as program pages. Now on these program pages, we have a couple examples for biology and cognitive science. There are requirements for what courses that you may want to take in first year because these courses in first year will be prerequisites to courses that you need to take in upper years. Uh, I think Maya can highlight some of the first year requirements just on this slide as it can be a little bit confusing to see. Um, Maya, yes. So if you see there, it says first year, uh, 2.0 credits and some required courses that you have to take in this case, bio and chem. Uh, just a couple of notation. Um, notes, I guess. Um, commas separating two courses mean that you need to take both courses to fulfill the requirements. As you can see here, you need to take both Bio 120 and Bio 130 uh, to fulfill the first year requirements of a biology major. And forward slashes uh, mean that you need, you can take either or of the courses on uh, the sides of the slash. So for a first year cognitive science major, you could either take CSC 108 or CSC 120. And you have to just take one of those to fulfill the first year requirement. Now we're going to take a brief second here to pause and see if anyone has questions about what we've talked about so far as a lot of this information is important moving forward. Um, Joseph, would you like to read out any questions about content that we've covered, if there are any? I think at this point, let's let's keep on rolling. There's nothing like really imminent right now. We'll address them at the end of the session. Okay, and just for the one person seeing which website this is from, if you search up U of T programs on any search engine, and you should be able to find a list of programs that you should be able to find. And Sienna sent the link. Um, yeah, I think we can move on then. Okay, so um, the next most important thing about choosing a course is whether you wanna take it or not. A great way to determine it is reading the course code or reading the course description. So what you're gonna do is if you go back to these slides, you have all of these different course codes here. So the first thing that you can do is you can either search the course code and plus U of T and there's usually a faculty of arts and science page um, that will give you the course description. Or you can also go to that program page that was on the previous slide and click that drop down menu for the descriptions. And it should be on the arts and science academic calendar. 
And you wanna read the description to see whether you should take it or want to take the course. Um, and this will also um, just keep in mind that this course may also be a prerequisite for other courses you wanna take, or it might have prerequisites you have to take before taking the course. So we're gonna go ahead and look over one of the course descriptions. So right here is what one of the course description looks like. So this one is for CSC 108, Introduction to Computer Programming, Tavisha's favorite program or favorite course from his first year. So the first thing on it uh, will tell you the course code and then the name. Um, the next thing on it will be the hours. So this one says 36L, that stands for lectures, lecture hours. So this one has 36 lecture hours for this half year course, which means that there's typically, um, there's typically around three hours a week. The next thing on it will be the actual description. So this one is programming in a language such as Python, and it gives some more specific details. And at the end, um, it is important to note that it says no prior programming experience required, which means that this is something that can be taken by someone who doesn't have any programming experience. Some other courses will have things saying um, with descriptions such as prior programming experience is required. Uh, and so that's important to keep in mind just so you don't fall behind or feel too overwhelmed during the course. Um, something else to note is it says here that you may not take this course co-currently with CSC um, 120 or 148, but you may take these after. And that's just, again, to make sure that you are up to date on material and you're not falling behind in anything. Uh, exclusions, we will go over this later, but basically an exclusion means that if you are taking CSC 108, you cannot take these other courses because the information is just too similar. Um, and then there's distribution requirements. So the, there are three different distribution requirements. The first is science, the second is social science, and the third is humanities. So it'll be in between one of those three streams. So if you're in one of those programs, it'll just help you um, differentiate on which category it's in. And the last is breadth requirements. We mentioned that earlier and we'll go over those later, but they're different categories. And this one falls under the mathematical and science, uh, or sorry, mathematical and physical universes category, which is category number five. And again, we'll go over this a little later. Um, but that's how you read a uh, course description. Well, the little later is right now because we talk about breadth requirements. Um, this one is um, quite daunting sometimes when you look at this list and then you see, oh, I have to like take care of all of these things, but I'll break it down to you. Basically, the breadth requirements are your requirements for elective courses. So this is a way that the university found to allow you to have a like a full circle of skills after finishing your undergraduate. So you won't just focus on a specific area, but you also dip your toes a little bit in different courses and different areas to learn different skills that you might not usually be presented with in your regular program. So the, there are five categories that correspond to each area of knowledge, more or less. The category one is creative and cultural representations. So courses in this area would usually be like language courses or cinema study courses, for example. And they're all about the creative side and the cultural side of um, like studies, for example. The category two is thought, belief, and behavior. This one is very common with the psychology courses, the religion courses, since they all have that same through line. Category three is society and its institutions. A lot of the social science courses will be included in this one. Some examples include Eco 101, which is economics or anthropology and history 102. Category four is living things and their environment. So a lot of the biological side of sciences will be included within this one. So that's your bio 120s or bio 130 and other upper year courses as well. Category five is the last one and it's physics and mathematics. So all your intro courses and upper year courses for physics like MAT 135, which is calculus and Chem 136, intro to organic chem would be within this category. So you have all these categories and in order for you to graduate and meet those requirements, you have two options. You can either have one full course equivalent. So that would be 
uh, eight courses or like eight semesters of you taking these um, four out of those five categories, or you can have three, one full course equivalents plus two others, 0 0.5 full course equivalents of other two. So you either take requirements from all five categories, but two of them are at a lesser um, FCE, or you have the four categories in full. So in total, you'd be taking four full course equivalents of breath requirements. And yeah, this, this might sound confusing, but if you have questions, do post them in the chat. And that's it. Next slide. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the words that you may have been hearing throughout this presentation. Uh, first of all, we're going to be talking about prerequisites. Uh, so a prerequisite is a course that you are required to take before you can take a higher level course in the future. An example of this is you need to take SOC 100 before you can take SOC 212. And the reason for this is a lot of the knowledge uh, that you gain from SOC 100 will be applicable to SOC 212 and they won't redo all of the basic knowledge from SOC 100 in that course. So they just require you to take the course in advance of SOC 212. A co-requisite is a course that must be taken alongside another course. And these are usually recommended but not required. An example of a co-requisite is PSL 301 is um, recommended while you take PCL 201. And the reason for that is PSL 301 really covers a lot of material um, alongside uh, PCL 201 that can be helpful to concepts that you take, in, uh, that you may discover in PCL 201. And Maya touched upon this, but exclusions are essentially courses that you cannot take if you've taken another course uh, similar to this uh, one because they cover similar content materials. So. Once you take, uh, in this case, MAT 133, you will not be eligible to take MAT 135 because it covers similar content and vice versa. Something else to keep in mind while taking your courses is the credit, no credit, and late withdraw. These are two things that are available throughout your uh, entire time in undergrad. So for elective courses, you can choose the option of credit, no credit, or late withdraw if you don't want this course's grade to be counted towards your GPA. Typically, this is um, the credit, no credit option. And this option serves as a pass-fail method, which uh, in which you need at least 50% in your overall coursework to get a valid credit. And the great thing about this is on your transcript, it will only show up as CR or NCR instead of giving you a numerical grade. If you miss the deadline for the credit, no credit option, you can reach out to an academic advisor to remove the course, which is known as a late withdraw. Unlike removing a course normally, a late withdraw will show up on your transcript, but there won't be any grades related to it. And something else to keep in mind is that you cannot credit, no credit, a program requirement. Um, so if it is required for your program, unfortunately you can't uh, credit, no credit it, you can late withdraw it and then retake the course uh, during a later semester. And another thing to keep in mind that isn't on here is that you can only take up, you can only credit no credit up to 2.0 FCEs during your entire time uh, as an undergrad. Uh, and here I'll give you a bit of a rundown on how to actually plan your courses before you put them on ACORN to enroll in. So here's a link for a mini tutorial video that you can watch later if you still have questions and if you want to refer back to. Also, Joseph or Marie, if you can post the link to the timetable website so they can follow along if they want to, that would be appreciated. And yeah, with that, we'll start. So the timetable website is one of the most useful tools that you find to put your courses together and see if they are clashing or if they all work and fit in your schedule. So when you go into that site and if you follow the link that they posted just now, you be greeted with this. You have these three tabs, 
And basically, if you already know the course that you want to take based on those program pages that you'd have visited before, you just type it in and click search for courses and then it will show up on the list below. But you can also search for departments or you can just use the chem one and that will show all the chemistry 100 courses available or you can even search by sessions. And if you notice, there's also an advanced search function and there you can filter things out by professor. If you really like this specific professor, you can check them out or uh, which day of the week it's taking place, which time of day. There's all sorts of filters that you can experiment with. So after you clicked on Chem 1 through 5 and then you search for courses, uh, there will be a list down below and now we'll go over them. So on your list, it will show up as the name of the course and then there will be three tabs plus the actual lectures that you need to take. I'll talk over some of the tabs that will be there. So timetable instructions are basically specific things that will indicate how you might want to organize your schedule. So for this one, it says that your practical sessions will be on alternating weeks. So that's good to know. So they won't happen every week. And some of them will happen on odd weeks. Some of them will happen on even weeks. So the information will be useful when you're putting things together. Delivery instructions are basically how the course will be taught to you. So some of them will be online, for example. Some of them will be in a classroom. That will give more explanation in that tab. And additional course information is the course description. So if you don't know what the course is and you just searched Chem 100s, and then you saw all these courses, oh, I don't know what one through five means. So that will explain to you what the course entails, what the prerequisites are and what the prerequisites are. This is the same thing that you'd find in a program uh, link. If you check the program page and then you click on the course link, that's the information you'd find. Next, we have the actual lecture sessions. Lectures are indicated by green and they are the classes that the professors teach. So there's three different types of activities that you'd sign up for. You have lectures, you have tutorials, and you have practical sessions. Lectures are just the class with the prof explaining to you the subject. And each of these things is repeated for all of them, but I'll go over them. So the Lecture activity, they will have a code because some of some of the classes have more than one lecture available, depending on the popularity of the course. The 99 code also indicates that it's fully online this year. And the next we have the time, so which days of the week it would be in. That's important to note when you're putting things together so you can't clash things together. There's also the room where it will happen. It's not always posted because they will be resolving when the course is made available. Next, you have the instruction. So your different professors. This course has six professors. The space available here, it's in full availability, has uh, 390 out of 390 available spaces. That means that no one has signed up for this course yet. But as the semester goes by, it will decrease over time. And if it reaches zero, then the course may or may not have a wait list. Here it lists as yes, it does have a wait list. So if there are no spots for you, you can get into a wait list, which is basically just a line to wait for people to drop so that you can get in. And lastly, it states if it's online or not. And then you can add it to plan if you would like that. Next, you have the practical sessions, which are basically the same thing, but these ones are often more um, varied because they are smaller in size. And that's where you would do your laboratories if you're in science or some writing session if you're in uh, another, another stream. Uh, and those are also 
not waitlisted. So if you cannot get into a specific practical session, you have to find another one or contact the professor. And lastly, we have the tutorial sessions. And uh, can you pass the slide? Yeah. So the tutorial sessions are just, as the name implies, it's a place where you can practice your skills that you learned in class. So often you'd solve problem sets with a TA, a teaching assistant, and you just practice the skills that you learned in class so that you may apply to it in the exam. And that's it. So after you put all of them together, you would have something like this. After you add all the things that you plan on taking, you'd have a sample schedule. So based on the sample schedule, you can see, oh, I really like how it's um, turned out. Or if you want to change anything, if something's clashing, you can always go back and change it. And this is just a draft for you and for your reference. It does not affect whether you're enrolled in it or not. All right, now that you have a sort of timetable figured out, uh, we're gonna move on to actually enrolling in your courses. Um, so we're gonna do a brief ACORN tutorial. There's a more comprehensive ACORN tutorial linked on the tutorial on, on the slideshow um, and we'll release that uh, later. Um, so this is ACORN. It's a website you may or may not have been on already. Um, and once you go on ACORN, there is a enroll and ma uh, manage uh, bar on the left. And that's what you want to click to uh, learn about how to enroll in courses. Uh, and this is unfortunately an upper year and ACORN. So you will not have the 2021 summer bar uh, available, uh, but you will have the 2021 to 2022 fall winter bar available. And once you click that, um, you should be able to see your enroll start time and date. Again, this one says July 12th because it is an upper year course, uh, upper year ACORN, sorry, but yours should say July 22nd. And you will have a specific time as well that you will be able to enroll in your courses. And keep in mind, time zones are a thing. So make sure that uh, you double check. Um, I believe these will all be displayed in EDT time zones. So make sure to convert to whatever time zone you are in to help you enroll at the right time. Uh, once you've checked that, you can click the courses button and that's where you can um, look at the courses that you've selected already in your timetable and try to add them to your enrollment cart. So in this example, we're using History 230, and you can just simply type in the course code that you have discovered from all of the previous steps. And once you click that, uh, you will be able to, you'll be taken a screen like this, uh, where you can look at the lectures and the activity. You can again, see the location and instructors uh, sometimes, but they're not always available and the space availability. And then you can add to your enrollment cart. Now, once it's added to your enrollment cart, that does not mean you're going to be enrolled in that course. That does not mean you're guaranteed a spot in that course. All it means is that it's going to be easier for you on enrollment day to enroll in the course once you have that, um, once it's in your cart. It's essentially like putting things in a grocery basket, but you still have to pay for them at the end of it. Um, so, once you have all of your courses listed in your enrollment cart, maybe you have a couple of backup courses as well listed in your enrollment cart if you're expecting them to be filled out by the time you reach your enrollment day. Uh, you can, on your enrollment day, you'll have your specific start time. And once you enter on that start time, you will be taken to this screen where you can physically enroll in the course. Uh, on the top right of each course, there is an enroll button. And once you click that and there's a confirmation screen, uh, you should be able to enroll in the course provided there are still spaces or you may be put on a wait list. Uh, it's really important that you do this enroll and no matter if you're in an FLC or if you're uh, even priority for this course, you still have to click that enroll button on enroll day or you will not be enrolled in the course, um, even if it's in your cart ahead of time. Okay, so we mentioned before enrollment time. So that will be 
uh, your like specific enrollment time will be available on July 5th, but there are two different enrollment periods. The first is the priority enrollment period, and that opens on July 22nd, and that uh, basically gives the opportunity to certain groups um, to enroll in those courses first, so those people are given priority to enroll. Um, so for example, I think like the Bio 120 and Bio 130 courses, priority enrollment goes to life science students over humanities and social science students because it's not required for the social science or humanities students to be enrolled in a life science course, whereas life science students have to be enrolled in those courses. Okay, so the next one is the general enrollment and that opens on July 30th at 12 p.m. Uh, Toronto time. So this is, means that most students will be able to enroll in those courses that were previously only open to priority students but keep in mind that some of these courses will have restricted one, two, and three, or like one and two. And so they might open on different dates. So keep those dates in mind as well. Uh, like I mentioned before, your enrollment start time is available on July 5th, and that will be the specific date you were allowed to go into ACORN and then press that enroll button for those courses. And you can find more information at that hyperlink there, and it should be dropped in the chat pretty soon if it hasn't already. Um, and something else to keep in mind is that ACORN will lock on July 21st for you. This is to make sure that the site doesn't get overloaded. So you have to make sure that all of your courses are in your enrollment cart prior to July 21st. And this is also important just because we don't want you to be stressing and like frantically searching up these course codes. It's really easy. Just make sure that they're in your enrollment cart. And then all you have to do is press enroll and then confirm your enrollment for each of them. It should take less than five minutes on the day of. Now we're going to briefly touch upon one of the unfortunate parts of course registration. Um, so if you, the course that you're trying to get into is full, there may be a wait list. And what you're on the wait list for is the lectures and not the tutorials. Unfortunately, if your desired tutorial is full by the time you enroll, you will have to pick a different tutorial. Um, and there will be enough slots uh, available that you should be able to find one that suits your needs. Um, if you, again, think that the course may be unlikely for you to get into, you may want to come up with a backup. Um, the waitlist also shows you exactly which rank you are on the waitlist. And depending on the class size and that ranking, you may be able to determine how likely you are to get into the class. But even if you think you have a good likelihood of getting into the class, I would still try to find a backup. Uh, course just in case you don't get into it and you may want to complete your full semester's worth of courses. Uh, the wait list uh, closes on September 17th so by that day you will know whether or not you got into the class that you were waitlisted for and the last day to enroll in new courses uh, is on September 22nd so you have a couple of days to find uh, some new courses uh, if you want to uh, if you unfortunately do not get into the wait list. And now we got a bit more specific with uh, the FOCs, which are the first year learning communities. And I saw in the chat that some of you were asking about this. So the FOCs are a small group of first year students where upper year students will give you more information about university and the different opportunities that we offer. And it will be under the supervision of one of the professors from that specific FLC's area. So for example, the life sciences FLC will have a life science prof attached to it. And in that way, you can actually talk to your prof in a setting that's not your classroom. So you can actually form a more not casual, but more comfortable um, setting to like meet your prof and talk to them. FLCs are very good because they already put you in the core courses that you need to take. So for example, the FLC for life sciences will already enroll you on all the courses for life sciences. So that'll include Bio 120, Bio 130, Mat 135, and chemistry. So they will already pick a specific time and date for you. And you don't actually have to do anything for those specific ones, just the elective courses. And if you want to switch things around, you can also alter that on the day. But um, that's very good. And also they will 
they do that so that all the people in your FLC are taking the same exact core classes so that you see each other more often and are able to form better connections because you see those people every day. And then you also meet bi-weekly in your small group to go over some resources or some games. There's usually food. It's usually pretty fun. The deadline to sign up for this has passed already, but down there is a link that you can follow if you want more information on it. And if you still wanna contact someone and see if they can open an exception, you can try it out. But for those of you who are signed up for, I've been in an FLC before and I think it's very valuable time that you'd spend. So I highly recommend it. The next thing is first year seminars. So seminars are smaller classes. They're around 15 to 25 students. And then they usually have a TA and a professor. And so these are opportunities for you to just be in a smaller classroom environment or versus like some of those bigger classes, like those intro classes, like Psych 100 will have um, a lot more people in it. So this is like a, a time for you to get closer with some of your uh, first year like classmates. Um, something else about the first year seminars is that these are exclusive to first year. So you wanna take advantage of them because as soon as you get into your second year, all of these courses are uh, no longer available for you. So these are a few courses here um, that are being offered by St. Mike specifically um, through the Christianity and Culture Program and through the Book and Media Studies Program. So just keep these in mind as you're choosing your courses. I would definitely recommend taking them um, like at least one seminar course. I took one that was the Vic 106 course and I had a lot of fun because I got really close with my prof and with a lot of my classmates and just gave me the opportunity to speak in a smaller classroom on a weekly basis. No, oh, sorry, I was muted. And here are some more resources. Some of them we already talked about and some of them are new. So I'd recommend going over them specifically if you are looking for more questions or if you want specific help. So you have the arts and sciences calendar, which is the thing where you find program pages. I personally use it mostly. Then you also have the course enrollment breakdown and that will give you more information on how to pick courses. Same with the next link. You also have the link to the FLICs, the FOCs. Then you also have the links for your specific degree requirement. So what you need to actually graduate and get a degree at the end of it. You also have the program areas, which have the program pages. Sid Smith Commons is also a good student resource that is more or less a hub for different things, including programs and courses and all sorts of things that usually gives you very like detailed but easy to follow information if you need to just understand how to actually do something. That's a very good resource. You also have the link to the SMC specific first year courses that Maya was talking about. And you have the program finder, which also has program page. Lastly, you have the registrar. So the registrar is St. Mike's um, like coordinators that they will help you to select the best courses according to your specific needs, according to your plans for your academic career and so forth. So if you need any help or if you need advising academically, they will talk to you, so email them. And that concludes our presentation. Um, the next workshop that we have will be a program selection workshop. And this one is very good for you who wants to know more about how the program thing actually works because you don't have to choose a program right now just at the end of your first year so this is a very good session to attend so be sure to tune in and with that being said we open the floor to q a so yeah i think we should go over the chat first if there's anything there's the the chat's quite hectic so we have a few kind of key questions that have been highlighted by um marie here so i'll start off with this one um so hello i keep um checking the timetable and i saw space availability availability getting taken 
All my courses are first level, and I believe that first year students enrollment starts on July 22nd. Would I be able to apply to the courses before July 22nd? And if not, why are the courses being taken already? Uh, does anyone want to take this one or I can, if you don't want to? I can take it. Um, okay. Yeah, so the reason that these courses are being filled is because of upper year students. Um, and these upper year students uh, would also have priority enrollment. So they would also be requiring to take this uh, course. Typically, there will be enough space if it is a degree requirement for yourself to take the course. And unfortunately, there is not really a way to apply beforehand uh, to the course. You will just have to wait until enrollment day. Um, but yeah, the way that it works for upper year students is that any course that is within our program or is required for a program, we have access to earlier. But then you will have priority over upper year students uh, for uh, courses that you need for your program. So for example, if I'm in a pharmacology and toxicology program, but someone else, uh, but you're a first year in a sociology program, you would have priority for the sociology class over me, but I would have the priority for intro to bio over a first year life science student because I'm in my fourth year of life sciences. I'm not saying I'm going to do that because I took first year bio in first year. Uh, and that's the case for most people. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have anything to add on to that? Uh, oh, and on top of that is uh, you guys have your start enrollment date on the 22nd. But um, depending on which year you're in or depending on how many FCs you've completed, you get an earlier time date. So for us, I think it was on the... 12 for yeah. fourth year and then like third would come after and then second would come after and the first years usually get the last place but as you progress you get earlier earlier times yeah um and adding on to that it also depends on how many fces you have so for example in my first year i had a really early start time because i came in with ib credits i did see something in the chat your ib or ap credits will automatically transfer in throughout the school year, but you do need to talk to the registrar about it because you can only take a certain amount of 100 level courses. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, you do have to forfeit some of those high school credits that you earned um, just to make sure that you're meeting all of the graduation requirements and degree requirements. Mm -hmm. Especially because some, um, for example, chemistry, you might have a transfer credit for chemistry in high school, but to get into the actual chemistry upper year courses, you need a grade attached to a specific chemistry class. So you need to forfeit it in that case. And you should talk to your registrar for more specific information. Perfect. Next question we have here um, states, I've been accepted into the life sciences admission category. Are there any courses I automatically have to take because of this? Or do I choose it based on what I want to major in? For example, could I major in psychology? Um, so I'm not in life science, but I will say you can enter, if you're accepted into a certain program, you actually can transfer over. So in my first year, I was accepted into the social science program, um, but I ended up wanting to switch the humanities and just automatically enrolls you uh, in your second year through the humanities stream. Um, but take the courses that you want for your program, and then you can deal with transferring the actual department later. It's not a big deal. Yeah. So in short, no, you don't need uh, the specific courses. Just uh, the, the main reason you're enrolled into the life sciences stream or whatever is so that you would get priority. So unfortunately, if you are aiming to switch, you may not get priority for the courses that you may need. So just keep that in mind while going forward. And if it also depends on which type of psychology you want to take, if you want to take the social science stream or the bio stream. Um, and if you're taking the bio stream, then you would get priority it, still in psych, um, but only for those like science based uh, psych courses. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to jump to another question here from the anonymous Q&A form. Um, essentially, how do I know whether a course is 0 0.5 or 1.0 FCEs? Um, you can find out, so when we go back, like if you go back to that course code slide, it either will have an H or a Y on it. 
an H stands for 0.5 credits and a Y will stand for a full point or one full point credit. Perfect. The next question we have here um, states in terms of um, how do we choose our courses in our second, third, and fourth years, similarly to how we choose our courses in our first year? Oh, that's a very good question. And I'm on the mind that you can look into it, but don't worry too much about it just yet. It will depend on what program you end up applying to. So in your program page, when you sign up for it, it will give you a breakdown of the specific courses that you're supposed to be taking. So it might specify second year, you should take all these courses or it will give you a list to pick from and then you just pick a combination out of those. So that's how you pick them in short. And I believe you'll be going over Degree Explorer and all of that next week in the programs yeah. workshop. So stick around if you want to learn more. Perfect. Another question here is, if we didn't get a course we want, and it may alter our schedule, are we able to remove other courses we have enrolled in? Uh, yes. So if you didn't get the course you want, you can remove that. Um, and you can swap around your schedule. Just make sure you have those backup uh, plans so that we can alter it the way you want. Um, but yes, you can drop a course um, up and there's a certain point where you have to um, like late withdraw, but before the school year starts, you can drop and add whatever courses you want. Um, so just keep that in mind, like your schedule isn't locked in um, until the start of school. And even then you're still able to change a few things around. Perfect. Um, let's ask, let's do one more um, question here based on the anonymous Q&A form. So I have one here that states um, essentially, um, more specifically, for FCEs, are we required to take five? Do we have to take five full courses or it can be, can it be three full courses and four half courses? So they're asking essentially about the combination for the five total FCE. Wait, can you repeat that last part, Joseph? Yeah, so they, they stated like, if we, if, are we required to take five CE, five FCEs? And if so, do we have to take like five full year courses or can we take three full year courses and four half year courses? Essentially like, um, what, like what are the allowed combinations for the full kind of course load? Oh, okay. Um, whether you take full or half year courses, it really doesn't matter as long, like just like the FCEs is the thing that matters. So any combination, whether it's full or half, doesn't matter. Um, you do need at least three FCEs to be a full-time student. So that is very important, especially for international, because sometimes like your student visa depends on you being a full-time student. And you also need 20 FCEs to graduate. So that would mean that you'd have, if you want to graduate in four years, you need on average five per semester but you can vary it you can also take some in the summer and depending on your plans for after you graduate if you want to go into med school for example some med schools will ask you oh like we want you to have full course load on each semester so you need to watch out for that and if you are not sure you can ask your registrar but Mostly you just need 20 FCs to graduate. So you don't really have to have five. And I did see a question pop up in the chat about, um, about the visas. So some visa requirements, um, sometimes uh, you will have visa requirements like you must be a full-time student in order to be eligible for this visa. So in that case, being a full-time student means that you have to take at least um, 3.0 FCEs throughout your entire uh, first year to be considered a full-time student to be eligible for that visa. Perfect. Yeah. So sorry, everybody... just to follow up on that, it's three FCE per year, <laughs> not yeah, per, sorry, year, per year. Yeah. No, you, you, so... you said it right, but there's just a question popping up. Uh, so. All right, so I'm gonna ask one last question here quickly before we wrap up. 
um, essentially the question is how important is arranging your timetable prior to the actual enrollment start? Important. Um, I think we can all say that it's really important um, because you want to make sure that you're not searching up courses during your enrollment time, especially for those classes that are really popular. Um, and that way, all you have to do is go in and quickly press enroll into those courses. So I'll say, for example, um, last year during my third year, I had um, a really popular linguistics course that I had to take. And as my start time was a little later, and so as that start time, as my start time was a little later, I saw the spaces in the class start to decrease and there were only a few spots left. So I had to prioritize that one and I had to go and quickly enroll in that one. So it is really important that you have your timetable set up so you're not um, kind of scrambling at the last minute and all you have to do is focus on pressing that enroll button. Yeah, like not just the timetable, but also make sure you have the cart ready on Acorn too. Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. and if you get your timetable set up earlier, that way you have more flexibility with planning. Like maybe you don't want to take classes on Friday or maybe, you know, you want to move a tutorial to a different day so you have a day off or, you know, so you don't have to stay downtown as much. Okay, great. Well, that there's a lot of questions still outstanding, um, but that's all the time we have for today. But we will be having a workshop Q&A to follow up this session on Wednesday. I'll pass it off to Sienna to wrap us up and kind of explain next steps here. Perfect. Um, well, actually, I have nothing really to say other than on Wednesday, we will have a follow up Q&A um, where you can further ask questions. And most importantly, a lot of people had really specific questions to what programs they're taking. I highly suggest emailing the registrar, booking an appointment with them, and going through your schedule with them. That being said, on July 22nd, just enroll in what you think you need, just enroll, because you don't want the class to fill up and you can make edits afterwards. Does that make sense? July 22nd, please enroll in your classes. You can make changes afterwards when you have an appointment. Perfect. Thank you guys all for coming today. Uh, we really hope that you felt that you learned something. And thank you to our workshop marshals for presenting this presentation today. And we hope to see you at nine o'clock Eastern time on Wednesday for any further questions before your course enrollment on Thursday. Yeah, thank you guys for showing up. This is very good. And yeah, do show up for the Q&A session because it seems like you guys got a lot from it. So I hope that this was helpful. And yep. apologies if we didn't get to your questions. There's just too many in the chat to get to in the allotted time. So um, if you have them, as Sienna uh, said, specific to your program, reach out to your registrar. Um, and if not, um, on Wednesday night, we'll be happy to chat with you about any specific questions you have to get you set up for Thursday. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. The person right. asking about the Q&A information, it will be posted on Quirkus as an announcement. The link is already there under um, Zoom links and feedback forms. So. Everything is there for you to peruse through the module. Yeah. And